now. And that means that every astronomy paper, research paper that's submitted to nature um, from anywhere in the world lands on my desk. And I'm the one who um, rejects the ones that are not interesting enough. And then I organize referees and then um, decide what to do with the papers after, uh, after the reports are in. So um, here's a brief bio that you can read while I'm talking. But um, you know what I really wanted to tell you about initially was how I became the astronomy editor of Nature. A lot of people um, very curious about that. So I was looking for a permanent job back in the uh, back in the early '90s, and it was a very tough time to find a job as, as an astronomer. And when I saw the, the job at Nature advertised, in fact, I had a wailing wall with 40 rejection letters on it outside my office. That's what postdocs and young people call the, uh, the, the wall of rejections, the wailing wall. And um, so I saw this job advertised in Nature. I, and I've been reading nature since late high school. So I thought, oh, well, I'll give a shot at that. And I didn't hear anything for um, a couple of months. And then I went off and observe, to an observing run in Spain. And um, when I came back, there was this FedEx package in my mailbox. And uh, this is when I was a visiting assistant professor at UNLV. And, um, and it had been sitting there for a week, and it had a, a deadline such that I had about 18 hours to do the um, tasks outlined in the, um, in the package, which was go through three of the messiest files they could find at Nature, multiple referees reports, adjudicators, um, appeals, and... Um, write it all up and get it fed, FedExed back. And, you know, I was jet lagged out of my mind coming back from Spain. I'd been up 18 hours a day observing. And um, so I thought, oh, geez, this isn't going to happen. But a couple of weeks later, I got called to Washington and um, met my uh, future boss. And there was another uh, timed test. I, I had to go through a file in about a week, or in, in about an hour. And uh, when she came back into the library, there were about 20 copies of the Astrophysical Journal um, scattered all over the table. And I hadn't finished my write-up, so she orally debriefed me. And then I went off to, uh, went back to, to Vegas. And a few weeks later, um, they wanted me in England. I was one of two finalists for the job. And at the same time, St. Mary's University wanted to interview me for a faculty job. And so I had to coordinate those two trips. And I ended up um, getting, I met a, a postdoc friend in London. We went out to a, a place in Chinatown for dinner and, um, and I got food poisoning the night before a whole day interview. Yeah. And um, so I was still pretty green when I got to the office. And um, I thought, oh, this isn't going to go very well. But then um, that, that was on a Friday. And um, I flew back to Vegas on Sunday. And when I went into the office on Monday, there was a fax waiting for me, um, offering me the job and giving me to Friday to decide in writing. And, uh, and so the, uh, so I called up the department chair at St. Mary's and I said, I've got an offer. And he said, you're, you're what, one of the top two. And, but we can't make a decision by Friday. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to go with nature then. And I've never regretted that decision. I've had a really fascinating career.
these are some of the telescopes that I've used. Um, Ar Arecibo, I'm sure everybody knows. Um, there's Kitt Peak, La Silla, James Clark Maxwell Telescope at Mauna Kea. And, um, and then these are the two telescopes that I've used the most. The old NRAO 12 meter telescope at Kitt Peak and the EROM 30 meter. So I spent well over a year of my life on Kitt Peak and about eight or nine months of my life on uh, Pico Veleda, if you add up all the observing runs together. And uh, my last year as a postdoc in uh, Germany, I was the single biggest user on the 30 meter telescope. But, um, you know, even though I'm not, uh, teaching students, um, it's a really exciting job, satisfying job, and I've, I've loved it. Um, you know, I get to see things be before anybody else. And um, there was a, a really interesting story from many years ago. Uh, so I had a, uh, a a um, paper submitted from a graduate student who spent his whole uh, research time at MIT studying the rotation rates of main belt asteroids. And what he discovered uh, is that they were not in, um, in a uh, Gaussian distribution as you might expect for a collisionally dominated population, but rather they were, it was bimodal, they were fast, prograde rotators and slow retrograde rotators, nothing in between. And, um, and so I thought this is really weird. His, his explanation for it was hokey and the, the referees chucked it out. And I said, look, don't, don't bother with an explanation. The, the observation itself is striking. And in fact, those uh, rotation states are now called Sliven states. Uh, his name is Steve Sliven. And, um, and then, but a lot of my job is um, delivering to authors a swift kick in the butt <laughs> um, because um, nature only publishes about 7% of what's submitted. And uh, the reason that, one of the reasons that I have to deliver this swift kick um, is conveyed in this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Now, I'll read it to you. I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realized that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an intimidating and impenetrable fog. Want to see my book report? The dynamics of interbeing and monological imperatives in Dick and Jane a study in psychic transrelational gender modes. Academia, here I come. <laughs> and the problem is that, um, you know, as scientists, we're not trained how to write. And we, we just read the astronomical literature or, you know, whatever area we're in. And it's almost uniformly bad. And so, you know, one of the really intense um, tasks I had to do when I joined nature was learn how to write better so that I could tell people, um, teach people. And uh, a number of years ago, there was a grad student at Yale. And um, at the end of, and, and she'd had this 5,000 word monstrosity, but there was that little nugget in there that, that I picked up and over a period of about six weeks, I worked with her to, um, to shine up that nugget. And, um, and it got published. And at the end of the process, she sent me this really nice email and said that that experience was the most valuable one she'd had at grad school. So um, it's very nice for editors to hear stuff like that. Now, every now and then, 
we get a surprise. And so late summer of 1995, um, I pulled the next new manuscript off the file, uh, off the pile, and it was from Michel Mayor and DDA Kalo. I'd never heard of them before. And um, they were claiming that uh, they had found a planet orbiting a sun-like star, 51 peg. And I looked at the data, looked at the figures, and, and I thought, well, this is looking pretty good. Um, but, um, you know, this was a field at that time was in utter disrepute. There had been a decade of failed claims and retractions and, and nothing had stood up to scrutiny. So the, the weird thing about 51 peg, uh, 51 peg B, was that the uh, planet is orbiting 13 stellar radii away from the star. And an old friend of mine, someone I'd met on my first day of grad school, Adam Burroughs, I knew was working on this topic. So I picked up the phone, hey Adam, I've got this paper from Michel Mayor, and, um, and he's got a planet, 13 stellar radii. Is that, is that possible? Is that stable? Could that last for, you know, five to 10 billion years? And he laughed and he said, Michelle called me three weeks ago with the same question. And the answer is yes. Now, not all such planets are stable. Some of them are puffed up and decaying, but, but um, 51 peg uh, was the first one. And, um, and then last year, um, that paper, led to the uh, Nobel Prize for Mayor and Kay Love. So uh, there's no such thing as an average day at nature. And, uh, and then um, I have lots of uh, stories, especially about cranks. Uh, I remember this one guy, it, I, I don't know if any of you uh, remember the face on Mars guy, um, Tom Van Flander. And uh, he submitted these two papers to me and, uh, and there, there was a conspiracy going on at JPL and um, to, to cover up the face on Mars. And, and, I, and so I rejected the papers and then I, uh, he called me, well, so he was calling me unbeknownst to me every day for about six weeks. And my admin assistant was intercepting the, the, the calls. And I finally overheard one of these conversations. And, oh yes, Dr. Sage is very busy. And I asked her what was going on. And he said, uh, she said it was Van Flander. And he wants to talk to you. And he's been calling every day for six weeks. And, uh, and so uh, I said, okay, tomorrow put him through. And you know, I can't have him harassing you. And uh, so he, um, he wanted to know why, uh, why I had rejected the papers. And I, I said, well, it's crank science. And he was very calm about it. And he said, well, other people have told me that, but there really is a conspiracy at JPL. And, and I said, well, if there really is a conspiracy at JPL, um, why don't you take it to the National Enquirer? I'm sure they would be interested. And he said, where do you go with this? Where, where can I go with this? And I said, nowhere, you've hit a brick wall. Well, surely I can appeal to your boss. And I said, look, I'll tell, um, I'll tell my boss about this conversation. Um, you can email him, he'll sit on it for six months and then tell you no. And so I immediately called my boss and said, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. And I'm going to share some of my um, travel adventures with you. Um, I'm juggling two computers right now. Uh, so <clears throat> the three guys here, the middle one is Michel Mayor. Um, one on the left is Nuno Santos, and that's Garika Israelian. 
and they were being awarded the first um, Embark Sumian Prize, which was a uh, half million dollars. So I was invited to speak at the uh, award ceremony in Yerevan. And, you know, I thought this was going to be a fairly low key um, thing, uh, thing. And um, it's a good thing I had my good suit with me because it turned out that I was going to be on stage with the Armenian president and the prime minister was in the front row. And we had dinner at the Armenian presidential palace afterwards. And um, so it turned out to be um, quite something. And, uh, and that the, uh, the observatory in the background is the Bayerkan um, Observatory. And uh, the, in the upper corner, the Ararat um, sign is in front of the uh, distillery that produced the uh, Winston Churchill's favorite brandy. So I went on the tour of the, of the uh, brandy distillery. That was quite fascinating. Armenia is a wonderful country. I, I loved it there. Um, Let's see, what, what's next? Um, oh, and uh, so I'll give you a couple of slides from my, um, from my presentation. So I had about eight minutes to talk about the impact of exoplanets on, on the public, um, because uh, it was four exoplanets, papers published in Nature that my, um, that my friends were getting the 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 uh, uh, Bart Sumian Prize, and um, and uh, so one of the so my final slide was this one, the um, Drake equation. Um, I presume most of you are familiar with it. The number of civilizations in the galaxy is the star formation rate times the fraction of stars with planets and the um, number um, of planets in the habitable zone and um, the, the fraction with life and the fraction with communication, um, a civilization that can communicate um, all multiplied by the lifetime, the average lifetime of a civilization. And um, right now, those last two numbers are the most uncertain. And one could argue that um, L is extremely uncertain given the way we're treating the planet these days. And uh, I don't remember exactly when the human genome came out, but I was invited to the party with along with my wife we, we flew a bunch of people over from london and we had the five directors of the national institutes of health um institutes that were uh, uh involved in the human genome project and craig venter who uh was head of the other project not the public one um was at this party as well so um after the after the uh, festivities were over, the directors went out, went out off and they uh, came back with t-shirts saying the directors. And they gave us a, uh, they were playing in a band. And Francis Collins, this was before he was head of all NIH. And um, he's actually quite a good musician. And uh, so they were singing songs like, this gene is my gene, this gene is your gene. And um, the editor in chief of Nature was standing next to Venter at the time, and apparently Venter steam was coming out of his ears. <laughs> and uh, this is my first trip to Australia. This is my best friend, Doug Hamilton, who's a planetary scientist. And I'd been invited to Australia to give a talk about nature. Um, and uh, Doug was on sabbatical in New Zealand at the time. So he flew over on, uh, 
so my work was done by uh, lunchtime Friday. And so he flew over Friday afternoon and we walked around the opera house and this is happy hour. Um, it's uh, late July. And then we were going on a walkabout around Australia. We were renting a car and, and um, uh, we went up to, uh, went to Dubbo and uh, Coonabara brand where the Anglo-Australian telescope is and back through the Hunter Valley. It was, it was a great trip. And there's the Anglo-Australian Observatory. And there's me with a roo. There's a whole, um, this is in the Warm Bumbles um, wilderness area. And uh, there were a lot of wild roos around. And you could get up to about within 20 feet off them. And then they just go bouncing away as a pack. So this was the closest I got to a wild roo. And then this is a trip I took to South Africa and I had um, like four stops there. I started in Johannesburg and went up to um, Mafeking and uh, then um, Potchefstroom and uh, then down to Cape Town. And the director of the SAAO is married to cousin of my best friend and um and he he took me up to the south africa large telescope and uh, we were coming up just as um uh the sun was setting and uh, so I, I took that wonderful photo with my phone and then there was uh, table mountain from the, the waterfront And I took that one that um, I was going to Sun City. And this was um, just a kilometer outside of the um, uh, hotel where I was staying, game lodge where I was staying. And I just rolled down the window of my car. It's a right hand drive in South Africa. And the zebra was right outside the car. You can even see the the side view mirror here in the photo. And, uh, but it's not all tea and biscuits. Uh, we, we drove by this road and, and I said to Phil Charles, oh my God, I've got to get a, a photo of that sign. We weren't driving on that particular road, but it, when it's so rough that they, um, tell you to remove your dentures, you know, it's a rough road. <laughs> and uh, this was a lion that had walked by. Uh, I was in a, uh, in a game preserve and it was, it was in a, uh, like a bus that just had canvas sides and the windows were open. And these three lions were walking right alongside the, uh, the, the vehicle. And, and I said to the tour guide, um, isn't this ex uh, extremely dangerous to, to be so close to the lions? And he said, as long as you stay in the vehicle, the, um, uh, the animals accept you as part of the, the, uh, the, the, the background. It, it's only if you step out of the vehicle that you become instantly identifiable as food. <laughs> and this is when I went down to the Alma inauguration and um, Chris Hadfield was speaking to the crowd. So Alma's the big array of um, radio telescopes of which Canada is a part down in the high Atacama desert in Chile. And um, so Chris Hadfield was space station commander at the time. And he, he was speaking to the, um, to the gathering. And so, you know, everybody's got their cameras out just like I did. Uh, the uh, backdrop for my slides uh, 
comes from a picture that I took at Alma when I was up at the high site. And it was, um, being at the high site was quite something. Um, it's up around, uh, what is it, uh, 5,600 meters. And so <clears throat> there, were, there were a group of us who were traveling together and we went over and there was a bunch of ambulances there because um, on that day, the Chilean president was going to be visiting. And so if any dignitaries got sick, they had to be able to whisk them down the mountain. And um, so we came over to take pictures um, sitting on the back, back bumpers of the, of the, uh, uh, of the ambulances. And the EMTs were great. They, they said, oh no, we can do much better than that. And um, so they had us each come in and lie on the gurney in turn, and, and we were taking pictures of each other. And then when we got back to the, um, um, to the base, I uploaded the picture to, um, to Facebook, just thinking, oh, this, this is a joke. And within 10 minutes, I had an email from a friend in London. Oh, are you okay? And I thought, uh-oh, I better call my wife and let her know this was just a joke. <laughs> but when you get off the bus at the high site, they give you a little canister of oxygen and they tell you, use it. And you really have to do it. I mean, it's, I've been to the top of Mauna Kea and this was way worse. Uh, let's see. Oh, and here, this was um, this was a terrific um, uh, adventure. So this was the brain Starmus was the brainchild of um, Greek Israelian, and he didn't know that many people, so he was relying on me to recommend uh, speakers and and provide um, introductions. So that he could he could get them, and on the astronomy side, that that was fine. Um, he had contacts in the Russian space program, and they got um, so we had some Russian cosmonauts there, and we had um, some American astronauts come as well. And um, my wife and I went over for this, and the um, the conference. Um, well, so what I had to do. I, I gave a talk uh, about, uh, we were all given assigned talks uh, or assigned titles. We had to write talks um, around that. And my assignment was, how has astronomy changed what it means to be human? So what I did was take the, um, you know, it was a general audience. And so I took the highlights from um, Astronomy 100, starting back with Thales and Miletus and, um, and, and you know, just stepping through all the, the, the different one. And then my other task was to um, moderate a roundtable discussion on the floor of the Grand Telescope of the Canaries. And the panelists were Jack Sostak, who uh, was Nobel in, um, uh, in chemistry. And I believe he won the year before George Smoot won it in physics. And um, Neil Armstrong, Alexei Leonov, who's the first person to walk in space, Jill Tarter, who uh, was at that time director of the um, SETI Institute in California, and Richard Dawkins, I'm sure everybody knows that name, and Brian May. And Brian had, um, taken a year off of, um, well, so Brian quit grad school in astronomy to form Queen. And then um, he decided, uh, I guess in his late 50s, that he wanted to finish off his PhD, and he, he did. And um, when he's not in his um, rock star persona, he's actually very shy and reserved. But um, it, was, it was quite something to, uh, to moderate these people. And uh, what, one of the, 
one of my favorite questions I put to Alexei. And, and I said, what about the Russian shuttle program? And he said, you know, we always thought the NASA engineers knew what they were doing. And if the Americans wanted a shuttle, then we had to have one too. We flew it once, realized it was a stupid idea and abandoned it. <laughs> and he just, he slapped the table and he laughed and he leaned back and, and it was just, uh, it, was, it was priceless. And there's a, the outside of the GTC on La Palma. And um, the, the girl here is Catherine Gray, and she was the one who officially opened the, um, the, the conference. Um, she was, at the time, the youngest person to have ever uh, discovered a supernova. And she's here with Neil Armstrong. And uh, so, um, because Garik said, oh, you're Canadian. Do you know the, the um, person who had the youngest uh, supernova discovery? And I said, I don't, but I bet I know someone who does. So I contacted someone at St. Mary's and, and they said, oh, yes, we know the family very well. And um, so they arranged for the, the family to, to come over to Starmus. And then uh, my wife and I were having dinner with George Smoot and his girlfriend at the time. Kip Thorne and his wife were off uh, to the right. And this is when Neil arrived. And S Smoot is well aware that he's a Nobel laureate. He's not bad on the few occasions when he, uh, when he forgets that. But when Neil walked in, it was like, he was like a teenager. Oh, Neil Armstrong, I've got all your albums. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was quite an entertaining thing. And then uh, uh, Brian closed the conference with We Will Rock You, of course. And then, uh, a few years ago, I was invited to give a talk somewhat like this one, but, but for a professional audience of professional astronomers um, in Xi'an, China, and um, where I got to see the terracotta army close up, um, which was fascinating, but it, would, it didn't hold a candle to this um, show they have about the uh, first emperor in Xi'an, the one who had the terracotta army built. It's this purpose-built theater. They do the show every night. Flames and lasers and lights and uh, uh, it, it was just spectacular. So if you ever find yourself going to Xi'an, uh, the show is well worth it. My, my boss was there uh, a couple of years ago and I told him to make sure that he got to the show and he said, oh, you were so right. It was spectacular. And then this is um, the um, royal carriage that the um, emperor was carried around in. And you know, they're still digging up um, the uh, terracotta figures. They haven't finished by a long means excavating the, the, the whole area. I think they've dug up about 100,000 so far. And then um, seven years ago, my mom called me and, you know, we talk every week and, and um, she said, on your next trip to China, would you take me? And I said, yeah, if your health is up to it. And, and so I was going on a work trip to China a couple of years later and my mom came along with me. And um, so here, here we are in front of the Olympic Stadium and on the Bund in Shanghai. And then this is Purple Mountain Observatory in the mountains above Nanjing. And my mom had um, her 86th birthday in Nanjing, and they even arranged a birthday cake for her. And um, after, and we were gone almost three weeks. 
um, traveling around. We'd also gone to Kunming and um, um, uh, yeah, and two trips in, in Beijing or two stays in Beijing. And uh, she had a great time, came home, put together a PowerPoint presentation and, and gave it to her, um, a couple of her social groups, showing them what she'd been doing on her trip to China. <clears throat> and then I was invited to speak at the Genoa Festival of Science. And um, this was a uh, number of years ago, it was a famous physicist, Giovanni Amelino Camellia, who does quantum gravity stuff. And so I had the, the prime position speaking at the end of the festival on a Saturday night. And this was quite a prestigious thing for me to be invited to do. And so I actually gave the same talk that I gave in the Canary Islands. And uh, my, my wife was taking these pictures of me while I was up there. We had a wonderful trip. And uh, so the Palazzo Ducale um, was all uh, decorated with various scientific equipment from over the ages because they always held the Festival of Science there. It goes on for about 10 days. And uh, that was a, it was a lovely trip. Uh, I like Genoa quite a bit. And then, um, this year, I scored another Nobel to uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Goetz. And here are some of their early papers. And um, I remember the, the first one in particular, they were doing um, uh, speckle imaging to try and beat down the, the noise in the galactic center. And boy, that, that uh, paper had a hard time with the referees. Ooh. And, um, but it finally got through. And these days, you know, they do it all with adaptive optics and you could go to um, space.com website or the UCLA astronomy department website. And you can see the um, movies of these 40 odd stars just kind of zipping around the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. It's quite fascinating. But um, in the early days, uh, they, they were working on the really ragged edge of what was possible. And, um, uh, and so here's the, the first one. So was, the original one was 39 stars. And this was back at a time when um, a lot of physicists still did not accept that black holes existed, um, particularly the supermassive kind. And um, so this pretty much um, did for that any argument. Um, they, they actually had a line in here. No, it was a later paper. But, um, Oh, and here's the first one from Andrea. And uh, the orbital period of one of the observed stars is as short as 15 years. And so Andrea has now been following these stars for over 20 years. And that, that's why they're getting the, the full orbits. And uh, yes, OK. And so this is where. They said the, the data no longer allow for a central mass composed of a dense cluster of dark stellar objects or a ball of massive degenerate fermions. I mean, that, then it was over. It had to be a black hole, nothing else would fit. Um, and uh, so one of the stars had a pericenter distance of only 17 light hours from the 
the black hole. And that's all I've got. Um, let the questions begin. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, very interesting. Why don't we uh, invite people to um, start their questions. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the period of time where you were doing uh, re radio research. What are some of the projects you were working on? Uh, well, I only, my, my last project was published um, 2012 or something. So, you know, I've been um, an active researcher up until then. My, my main collaborator was uh, Gary Welch at St. Mary's University. Oh, yeah. And, and then when he, um, um, he was the last of the cohort who was forced into retirement. And um, so he worked for about another three or four years after that. We, we had observing runs um, at Pico and um, Arecibo. We had one at Green Bank. I will never, ever, ever propose to the Green Bank Telescope ever again. <laughs> um, NRAO builds the best radio equipment in the world. Their software is awful. It always has been awful. It, it, and it was just painful using that telescope. So my career started um, in the era of IRAS, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And, uh, and my project, my PhD project was on um, the effects of interactions on galaxies and how it affected star formation. Now, in 1984, uh, uh, this was not really um, a thing. And in fact, almost a hill at my proposal defense even said, well, we all know that galaxies don't interact. All you have to do is take the number of galaxies and divide by the volume of the universe, and it's obvious they won't interact. Of course, five years later, there was a complete sign flip on that. Um, but part of the trouble at the time was that the field was dominated by Chip Art, who, um, you know, with the Art Atlas of Galaxies, and he'd gone nuts. And so the, um, the field did not, was not very popular. And then at the end of my PhD, and I was writing up the, the final papers, and I said, you know, I don't know what a normal galaxy is. In, uh, so I was studying infrared and molecular gas um, as traced by carbon monoxide. And, and I didn't know what a, didn't know what a, a regular know, galaxy was. Like. So, um, so I'm getting um, an echo. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, my, my big postdoc project was to go off and do a distance limited study of um, normal non-interacting galaxies. And uh, that led to all the observing time that, that I had uh, at, at um, Pico and the 12 meter, and I also used Effelsberg for um, 21 centimeter. That was a really nice telescope to use, but boy, is it out, out in the boonies. Uh, well, so is Green Bank, but at Green Bank, <laughs> um, the first time one of my old friends went there, and so this is back in the oh, early 80s, and, and she was, you know, a young woman on her own doing an observing project, and the um, the dining room staff was all local people, West Virginians. And they came out, one of them came out to her and said, where's your man? <laughs> so for anybody who knows Lucy Zuris, uh, this, <laughs> this did not go over very well. And, uh, and so then I, I just continued working with Gary on, uh, we, we went on to, um, look at um, uh, lenticular galaxies, and then we were looking at um, elliptical galaxies. And while 
it was thought that there was no gas in elliptical galaxies that turned out to be incorrect. And um, so, so those are the, the projects I was working on. Okay, uh, a few questions have come in, so let's, let's start working on them. Um, any regrets in retrospect about a paper that should not have been published but was? Um, yeah, there was the whole Shun thing. Um, there, there are some astronomy papers that, you know, in retrospect, shouldn't have been published, but mostly it was um, people working on the ragged edge of what could be done. Um, three sigma result. And John Bacall used to say um, a three sigma result is wrong about half the time which I've found to be true. But there was this um, condensed matter physicist working at uh, Bell Labs who faked his data. And it looked like he was on a fast track for a Nobel Prize. And, um, uh, and then a woman had been offered an endowed chair at Princeton and they withdrew that offer to give it to Shun and she said that she was going to make it her mission in life to bring him down, and she did. Um, so, and I handled some of those papers because I, I handled high temperature superconductivity for nature for a while um, for various internal staff reasons. Um, the, the one that I regret getting away is the first fast radio burst paper. Oh, which yeah. the, which was submitted to me in 2007. And I, I read the paper and I said, boy, this is weird. What, what do you make of this? And I sent it to three referees and they all came back and said, this is weird. We don't know what to make of it. And it was one off thing. And then for about five years, it was either attributed to um, uh, Earth's magnetosphere or um, a leaky microwave oven that the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. And, um, and, then, <clears throat> and then the repeater was discovered in 2012. Uh, and that's when FRBs all of a sudden became hot. And um, um, I, put, I put three on the cover of Nature. Um, one for Maricibo, yeah, I think three, um, and certainly Chime, and I thought there was another FRB telescope that got a cover. And um, so um, that was, that was a, a big regret in retrospect. Yeah, I bet. So, um, but but they, the FRB people come to me first now anyway, so <laughs> all, all is forgiven. You mentioned your crank story. Do you remember any other, uh, any crank stories that uh, you had to oh, yeah. turn away forcefully? <laughs> so, so there was this guy who wrote to me every two weeks for two years. And uh, well, so I, I should preface this. Part of my initial training in London was my uh, then boss uh, was uh, Laura Garwin. Um, she was She's Dick Garvin's daughter. Um, and Fermi said that said of Dick Garvin that he was um, Fermi's um, uh, smartest student. And so, so part of the training that I had to do was take all the crank papers, figure out what the problems were, and write to the authors and explain them. And uh, so at the end of about six weeks, she, she said, what have you concluded from this? And I said, they all make the same mistakes. They all have way more time than me. And she said, that's right. Now be completely ruthless with them from now on. <laughs> and so, so not long after I um, moved to Washington, um, I, was, um, I started getting these letters from this guy in, in Florida. And you know, he was showing how the, um, yeah, the, the, the classic um, physics example of the lightning strike had 
on each end of the rail car. And, um, and Einstein got it wrong. And it was actually this guy who got it wrong. You know, he doesn't understand what an initial frame of reference is. And uh, so anyway, um, he, I, this was back when things were sent by, by mail. And so he would get a postcard every two weeks. The editor thanks you for your um, uh, submission, but regrets he is unable to publish it. We can enter into no further con correspondence on this matter. So after about a year of the um, bi-weekly uh, mail, he started offering to come to the office and explain to me why I was wrong. And, you know, he kept getting the postcards. And then, um, uh, and then he, he sent a letter to the then Director General of the United Nations, which I think was Kofi Annan at the time, uh, uh, complaining how I was single-handedly holding back progress in physics. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say that uh, I know that the editor of the RAC Journal and the editor of Sky News received the same uh, packages from, from time to time. So I'm sure all editors have to deal with uh, these unsolicited uh, packages. Yes. And... Um... My uh, colleagues at the University of Maryland complained that, you know, once they've written the news and views for nature, then the, the, there will be a, um, a ripple of cranks that come into them. <laughs> so. Uh, all right, here's another question. Um, uh, at a time when science's achievements are so impressive, societal, societally science illiteracy, if I could read and write and speak here, science literacy seems to be growing. Uh, are we leaving too many people behind in our communication of science or have we more to learn regarding how to use social media tools to combat stupidity? In 30 words or less. <laughs> yeah, you have kidding. 30 seconds, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> take your time. Uh, yeah, this is... Um, This is something that really bothers me down in the States. And uh, we're going in the wrong direction. And some of the stupid seems to be um, floating north over the border. And it's something that I do worry about. Um, part, of the, part of the problem is that um, We, we teach science wrong. We teach science as a body of facts, which it isn't, it's a process. Mm. And um, and so then you'll, and you'll get these religious fundamentalists who will, you know, regurgitate the stock answer, but, but you know, they're told by their parents and their church that um, the earth is only 6,000 years old, and that's what they really, really know. Um, so it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. And uh, we, we are not doing a, a good job with it. Uh, I think overall, Canada does a much better job. Um, I, I worry about parts of the UK. I mean, I didn't take Trump seriously until uh, June 24th, 2016, the day after the Brexit vote. And I thought, oh my God, if they can do it in, in the UK, what's going to happen here? So um, I, there's no short answer. But I, I, I think part of it is... Um, we, we have to completely rethink how we teach science. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, okay, a uh, couple, couple parts to this question. In the past 20 years, did it happen that any paper got accepted by nature that was just 
pure theory and full of equations. Example yes. presenting physics, astronomy, fundamentals without providing any observational data from radio telescopes or optical telescopes. Yes, and I handled that paper. Uh -huh. um, uh, the author is Dave Toms, and uh, that was from 2007 or something like that. And there were 50, 60 equations. It was all theoretical physics. Um, but, you know, it used to be uh, back in the 70s, um, nature mostly published theory and very little observation. And then um, my predecessor, two back, who recently retired as, as editor in chief of nature, um, decided this was for the birds. And they made a conscious decision that they were going to focus on um, observational papers rather than theory. And so in 1985, we had 2% of the top cited astronomy papers. By 1995, we had 20%. And we've gone on from strength to strength there. So um, there, there is, we'll look at the, the papers when they come in, but there is no um, push to increase the number of such papers. Okay, and for reviewing the papers that you receive and decide to uh, whether or not you're going to publish, how many referees are involved and do you bring in external referees from academia or are they all internal nature referees? Uh, they're never internal. Okay. Always, always external. You know, we can ask colleagues their opinions on, um, on various aspects of papers, but the referees are always external. And they're not necessarily uh, academics. There was one paper that I handled. I also handled lightning papers. And um, there was a, an Italian fellow who thought that um, when these gamma ray sprites had brought down the Air France flight that had crashed off the coast of Brazil, and my wife works for the FAA, and I, so I said, um, who's your chief scientist? And she got me his name and contact information. So I sent the paper to him, to the referee. And, um, and of course, you know, a year or so later, the, uh, they did find the, the ruins of the aircraft and recovered the black box and, and figured out what went on. It wasn't a gamma ray sprite. Mm -hmm. Okay, but third I, part of the, sorry, go ahead. Um, with regard to numbers, it's usually two, um, sometimes three, uh, occasionally as many as five. Um, and it, it all depends on how many aspects there are to the paper and what the expertise is of the referees. And sometimes you, you need very specific expertise and that, that is only increasing as um, multi-messenger astronomy becomes more popular. Okay, and how long in the time frame between receiving a paper and deciding that it will be published and then publishing it? What generally is the time frame there? So if a paper comes in in good shape and um, there's no pandemic, it used to be about three and a half months from submission to um, acceptance. And then publication would be four to six weeks after that. Okay. Um, but, um, and usually the tip, the, the longest chunk of time was author revisions. Um, but in the COVID era, everything takes at least twice as long. And um, so we, we are really struggling now. We've, we've had, um, what, close to 2,000 submissions on COVID. Oh, boy. Yeah. So they would get a little bit more space these days, I would imagine. Well, most of the papers were pretty bad. <laughs> so, um, but, but we have published some good ones. But the editors were just totally swamped. Um, 
a normal manuscript load is um, eight or nine manuscripts a week. And, and these editors were getting 50 a week. Can you remember papers in Nature, say in the last 15 years, which essentially predicted COVID? Uh, I am not aware of that, but given that Obama actually set up an office to, to deal with exactly this situation, uh, I think that it was well expected that something like this would come along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, here's a question. Uh, you know, you've seen many papers which, you know, I'm sure are, were exceptional. Uh, have you seen any on your first read that you thought would be contenders for a Nobel? So that's a tough question because, um, you know, the, the Nobel bequest specifically excludes astronomy. And um, they dodged that question with uh, uh, Michel and Didier saying, well, it changed our perception of where we are in the universe. And Jim Peebles as the father of modern cosmology certainly deserved it. Um, if I would have said those and, um, you know, the early ones and, uh, localization of the FRBs and the discovery of FRBs, um, is going to be a contender in the future. Um, but, you know, there's typically 20 years between the, the first results and the um, prize being awarded. Yes. And so it's really hard to predict what will happen 20 years in advance. And I was talking to my best friend ab about this a couple of weeks ago, and he said, so what have we really learned um, about the center of the Milky Way before these early results? Uh, you know, uh, uh, after these early results, and I said, well, you know, we have more stars and they're better orbits and we've, we've tracked them. And he, so he really pressed me on it. And I said, well, you know, okay. I have to concede that, that I don't know that there's anything specific that's been um, done in the, the past five to seven years that added materially to our understanding. Okay, uh, one more question here. Um, how much of an impact has AI had on recent publications and any future predictions on articles with AI component? Can AI have a role in reviewing articles for publication? So I published one of the early AI papers in, uh, in astronomy. It was um, by a fellow who's now at McGill, I believe. Um, and he was using it to uh, solve uh, for the um, strong gravitational lensing, find out, you know, build the field and find out what the, the lensing galaxies were looking like. And this was something that, um, that it took a trained person six weeks to do by hand. And they could do it uh, in um, uh, in milliseconds. So AI is going to have an impact, um, and I'm actually glad I'm going to be retiring in four years because <laughs> I, uh, I do worry about the AI is going to put a lot of people out of work. And I, I don't know how this is going to play out. We have not, um, we have not got the in-house expertise to, um, to start using AI to referee papers. That might be something we would consider at some point in the future. But then you always wonder, 
um, has the model been trained properly? Um, and they, and the, the, the other worry is that, um, you know, a lot of the AI will throw out outliers. So, um, and, and often the outliers are where the, uh, where the real science lies. Let me tell you the story about Jeff Marcy. Um, so he was hunt hunting for exoplanets at the same time as um, Mayor and Kalo. And um, he had inserted into his um, data pipeline um, a, uh, um, an if-then loop that, that would just remove any planet that had uh, a, uh, an orbit of less than, I don't know what it was, 50 days or something like that, because he said, it's obvious there are not going to be any planets there, so I, I want to filter out all these false negatives. And Michel went and presented his work at a conference while the pa Nature paper was in press. And, um, and uh, Michel had never put such a filter in. And Marcy was at the conference, he saw that, went home, removed the filter, bang, up popped 51 peg. So he went out and held a press conference. Well, um, my auth authors were under embargo. So he got a lot of the initial um, publicity, but um, that situation righted itself after 25 years. Mm. But. Um, but I, I do worry, I, I have this twofold worry about AI that, that is going to lead to homogenized science where people don't, um, where the, the really interesting outlier stuff isn't getting looked at, it's just getting chucked out. And, and then I also worry about the employment issue. So on the other hand, um, once data starts coming out of um, LSST, um, I mean, 35 terabytes a night is an awful lot of data. So. Is there an area of astronomy that you haven't seen a paper from that you'd like to see come across your desk sometime? Or is it pretty well all been covered? Um, so I would like to see um, some gravitational wave action. Um, but the LIGO people are all particle physicists and they think of physical review letters, they don't think of nature. Um, mm. uh, other than that, I try to keep things um, pretty even. You know, what I don't want is for uh, nature to turn into uh, high redshift exoplanet ghetto and everything else is, is ignored. So, you know, I've consciously gone after um, some really interesting stuff that'll never get well cited. Um, but, you know, there, there's no place that um, uh, I think is systematically underrepresented relative to the number of people working in the area. One place I'd like to see fewer papers from is supernovae. Ah. The supernova people are all nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I know a few people I'll mention that too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had a particularly frustrating exchange with, um, with some supernova guy a number of years ago. And uh, so I emailed Dieter Hartman, who handles supernovae for uh, the AppJ. Uh, and and I, um, I e emailed him with that question, is everybody in the field nuts? And, and within 30 seconds, I got the answer back, yes. <laughs> did he expand on that? Is there a reason or do they just, supernovas attract different types of people? Uh, mm, I, I think it's, I think it attracts certain hyper competitive people. Mm. And, um, and there's already been 
um, you know, Bell's awarded for it. Um, so, you know, um, um, uh, Adam Reese and um, Saul Perlmutter. Um, whenever there's a Nobel, you know, the, the people tend to rush into, uh, into an area. And there was a problem in, in uh, high temperature superconductivity. I was handling that for, for um, about 15, 16 years. And here's a field where uh, over 200,000 papers have been published since 1986. And there's been no discernible progress in understanding. Jeez. And, and the, the only reason people have migrated out of the field is they see the um, free trip to Stockholm at the end of the rainbow. Mm. So, um, and, and that was a field that I hated dealing with it. It, it was the most pathological science area of science I've ever seen. The next one down is supernovae, but they, they're an order of magnitude below um, the, the high TC people. <laughs> oh, jeez. I think this is a world that many of us have never even imagined existed. <laughs> so, look, it's been a pleasure, uh, Leslie, uh, having you uh, uh, tell us about your world uh, with nature and uh, highly competitive astronomers and... Uh, <laughs> all of the adventures you've had. I want to thank you very much. Do you want to mention just uh, uh, you've, you've shared your email and phone number up there and you mentioned earlier today that uh, you'd be interested in hearing from people if they wanted to contact you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I, I make this offer on um, every talk I give and, and people will rarely take me up on it. Um, for young people, uh, you know, I say, I can give you career advice. Um, I could give you advice on publication strategy. Uh, um, I could just relate more stories. <laughs> uh, That's very generous of you. Um, I want to thank you for sharing, uh, sh you know, speaking to uh, the Mississauga Center today and RASC. I've noticed people from across the country who were who were signed in. Um, I want to invite you, uh, if you're ever up, uh, you know, Mississauga way or seeing family, uh, please let us know. And we'd, uh, if we have a meeting, we'd love to uh, have you come in and, uh, and, uh, and chat with you face to face. Oh, I'd love that. Um, my sister lives at um, um, Eighth Line and Upper Middle in Oakville. So it's not, not very far from no, nope, No, no. No, that would be great. And I, I want to mention that uh, uh, Leslie has asked us to his to contribute his honorarium for tonight to the Canadian Alzheimer Association. So we'll be uh, be very glad to do that. So thanks again, Leslie. And uh, let me just say a word about our our next meeting is in two weeks. Uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Daly, who uh, is. Uh, at the uh, Lausanne School of Engineering at York University, and he's the chief scientist on the LIDAR on the OSIRIS-REx mission, which very timely uh, successfully uh, picked up some material from uh, the asteroid a few weeks ago. So he'll be uh, sharing the latest on that mission and uh, the plans to, to bring the uh, samples back to Earth. So that's two weeks tonight, and uh, we'll uh, promote that on, uh, on our email, uh, email list. Uh, so that's that's all. I want to thank again. Uh, I think we're seeing several uh, thank yous from uh, the uh, people um, online here, uh, Leslie from Vancouver, uh, uh, right across the country. So thanks again, and uh, wish everyone uh, stay safe. And uh, Leslie, have a great Thanksgiving down there. Okay, Good luck in uh, crazy Washington D.C. land over the next couple months. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then. Bye. All right. Thanks again. And thanks again, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.